Hi everyone and welcome to Male Mobility Talks, this time as part of IAA Transportation. Too much weight, too little performance, too little range and speed. What sounds like the ongoing debate about e-mobility was actually the main issue of combustion engine over 150 years ago. Therefore, the Hippo Mobile, the very first vehicle with a combustion engine, never made it beyond tinkerer status. Today, we have lighter, more efficient and powerful engine, which are now to be discarded with e-drive. So, was everything in vain in terms of development or is there any potential left we can use for future mobility and transportation? That is what we're talking about right now and I'm glad to have him here. Dr. Marco Ward, Vice President, Global Product Development, Engine Systems and Components. What a great business card, I think. This is very <laughs> huge in, in my opinion. <laughs> so Marco, you also lead the development of combustion engines um, at Male. Um, according to the current debate about mobility transformation, will you ever have to look for a successor for your job or are you something like a last unicorn? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a fairly good question. A last unicorn, I'd say probably not, because as you know, good things will last forever, as one of the famous sayings goes. Of course, this is not true for all the technical innovations that we've seen so far, but we have to be on a more serious note, really, a bit more objective, a bit more realistic when it comes to those debates. And looking at that, this is definitely what I do uh, on a more global basis and also on all of the applications that we're looking into. And I guess this is if we bring that debate back into an area where we are more on the fundamentals, on the technical, on the real data and the factual parts, then I think w there is a very good chance uh, that we'll not need a unicorn, basically, <laughs> uh, and we see uh, an end of the internal combustion engine any time near, but we will see the internal combustion engine being on the globe and moving both society and transportation forward for decades to come. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned uh, the combustion engine right now, and we're talking about this topic, of course, but I've, uh, I've done some research beforehand, and I saw that you have a wide range of technology solutions. So is it because you can't really commit to one of them because you say, ah, I'm not sure how the future will look like, or is it more on purpose because you say that, you say that there won't be just one solution for the future? Correct. There is no silver bullet. There has never been a silver bullet in the whole past. You just mentioned it even in the very early stages. So over a century ago, when mobility started, there were multiple versions of transportation. So the drivetrain basically was always just a means how to get somewhere or how to transport something. It was never the one thing that was only electric, only internal combustion engine, or only a fuel cell. All of those systems we have seen in the past, we have seen a decade or a century ago. What we now see looking forward is that we use them in very distinctive ways. We use them for the right purposes at the right time and for the right applications. And this is actually what we as Marley also support our customers together with our suppliers and everything, making mobility possible. And of course, the overarching goal that we're trying to achieve, and we're fully committed to that, is CO2 neutrality, so to reduce this impact, the negative impacts of transportation. There is no doubt transportation plays a major role in global CO2 emissions that we see. Trying to reduce that, we're committed, we're trying to reduce that by 2040 to become carbon neutral. The way there is not a way with a single solution only. The way we do that, we need all levers that we have, and that includes all of the aforementioned possibilities of drivetrains. Mm -hmm. Could you name some numbers to say, okay, this part will be electric, this part will still be um, with a combustion engine. Are there any relatives in, in that area? Yeah, sure. Uh, according to our prognosis, and that's just what we always try to plan and establish for and say, how is that looking on a global basis? We see by 2035 that roughly 30% of all commercial vehicles that includes on highway, off highway, agriculture, construction side vehicles will be electrified, uh, whether that's battery electrified or with a fuel cell electrified. This is up for still unknown a bit, so the fraction exactly that will be seen in the near future. But aside of that also means 70% of the new vehicles still coming into operation 
will be driven by some form of a combustion engine. And that now counts for commercial vehicles or commercial just vehicles, for everything? Correct, for commercial vehicles. Okay. When we look at the passenger car sector, this is obviously a smaller fraction there. We see a more aggressive trend on a global level and certainly even more on a European level with the mandate from the European Commission to say by 35, 2035, we'd like to have no new zero two emitting vehicles basically mm -hmm. being produced and sold. And that means this goes down and we will see still more than 50% probably in battery electric then by 2040, mm -hmm. uh, by 2035. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So uh, passenger car first and then uh, the trucks and commercial vehicles a second in somehow. Um, yeah. Where will the combustion mm -hmm. engine play a major role in Europe? I mean, 70% is, is still a huge number. Yeah. In global terms, uh, it will be anywhere where the infrastructure is not there to sustain a fully battery electric drive, being it whether the, the network's not there, whether the power generation is not possible, or whether simply the whole infrastructure in terms of roads, of system parking, is not available. This starts from the very cold places in Antarctica down to the where heated waves or somewhere in the middle of Africa in the desert. Today, the what makes it so interesting also and fascinating in terms of commercial vehicles is that they actually are used for so many various applications. Anything from moving goods, as I said, in different locations, moving smaller goods, larger goods, on highway, off highway, being a railroad, being a even marine applications, all of those are used to a very powerful power source and a drivetrain and we need to convert those into CO2 neutrality. And this is the biggest challenge that I see. This is a more holistic way. It's not probably about just the powertrain, but it's actually making the mobility and the transportation logistics goods that we need CO2 neutral. So to achieve the climate goals, there's one way to replace the drivetrain uh, with an alternative drivetrain like uh, e-drive, or you can try to improve uh, the um, remaining uh, combustion engine like we have right now. I've got the feeling that we've developed it till the end uh, <laughs> over decades. Is there still room for improvement or uh, is it like, okay, we're done, that's it? Yeah. There's certainly room for improvement, but let me come back to the very first statement that you said there. Is it either or? And to be very clear and precise about that, it's not either or. Today's demand, basically, in terms of CO2 reduction that we want to achieve, as a, and if we're serious as a society to reduce the CO2 reduction, then there's a clear and between those two things. So yes, some of them, wherever possible, we will convert, we will try to get to CO2 neutral, but that also includes the whole pre-chain, if you like, so mm -hmm. all of the power generation needs to be carbon neutral. We can't just go straight from basically tailpipe and say, or battery to tailpipe kind of view. We'll need to look at it from a holistic point of view. And we'll need to further improve all of those ways where we struggle, where we probably don't have an easy path in, continue to improve. And to pump to your second point there, <laughs> we're not at the end of there. There's certainly room for a further improvement. And if you think about today's engines, modern engines really achieve in a large diesel engine, up to 45% efficiency, further increasing that, we'll see a fair chance, and I'm a true believer from what I've seen in the results so far, we can get up to the 50%, so making that significant more than 10% more efficient. And as I said, it's an and between those things. We need to pull all levers if we are serious about carbon neutrality. 50%. I think yeah. a lot of tech fans out there are white-eyed uh, white right now. Um, yeah. um, I can't imagine how that works. I mean, we're here, just us two, so <laughs> you can tell me how it works. Maybe we can do a little tech deep dive into it. How do you uh, really achieve that 50% efficiency? Sure, Sarah, yeah. There are a With few all, things- With all your uh, <laughs> secrets, of course. Of course, <laughs> no. Um, not trying to deep all of those secrets in there, but what we do is, is lots of little steps. As you said, it has a longer history, so we have experience gained. We know where the boundaries are and where we need to improve. To give you a simple example, it starts from the very inner part of an internal combustion engine, which is the piston, which is core to Marley's history. It's also where the company came from. So we start from a piston, optimizing a piston, and by that also the combustion, 
gives us the possibility to come to a more efficient combustion, so higher temperatures, better cooling, so the mechanical and thermal structure of the engine Improving this enables us to come to a higher efficiency right from the start from the combustion, reducing friction, all of the losses, ancillary losses that we see, bringing that down, getting variable oil pumps in so to only operate the ancillaries around an engine as much on where needed and not having them a constant high power. It's a bit like, if you've excused that kind of com comparison, we also try to optimize all of our systems throughout days and days. So if you have a smartphone, you won't have the screen on all the time because that would draw the battery way too big. And it's a similar kind of analogy if you go to the combustion engine parts. You want to have them fit for what they are, the demand is, but not constantly running at peak power. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a good uh, keyword, uh, the thermal management. We've got another talk, you will see it soon here on our channel about thermal management and what is possible in terms of e-mobility. But let me get back um, to uh, this developing uh, thing here, because I think that is very interesting. You men you've mentioned a lot of components of this combustion engine, only the combustion engine. I guess that's a pretty tough task to develop. Um, yeah technology this times with all these fast changing parameters right now. How do you do that at Mahle? Do you, um, let's say, co-improve and invent with your customers and your partners and even startup suppliers? How do you do that? Yeah, definitely. So it's a very good point there. It's, it first starts with the people that drive those innovations, so that drive those new ideas and bring them into reality. And this is always a people's business where you start globally working together, you say with partners, with customers, together to bring those innovations, not just at technical level to show that it can be done, mm -hmm. but then also into production and into the hundred thousands and millions of produced parts equally on the same level. And this is one of the fascinating things for technology guys, uh, with a kind <laughs> of a, a spirit And for I guess it. you are, Ron. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> Just I'm guess. technology guy, yeah. But also on the other side, I'm fascinated by the kind of scale up and mm -hmm. what actually can be achieved if you are determined, if you have the right people working together there and bringing those things to reality. As much as I like high numbers and as much as like a fantasy from a technology point of view, I'd like to see those things really moving around. So I'm more of a car guy in terms of having things moving than just having a number that says, yeah, that efficiency can be done. Yeah, the traffic turnaround just can be achieved with uh, with the whole society, I guess. It's, it's teamwork to do that. Mm -hmm. um, let us get back to the drive drain and the combustion engine uh, again. Um, don't you think that it's a wrong question to ask um, can we replace the combustion engine? Is it rather, can we uh, re replace what we burn in there, what we combust in there? Is it more like, okay, we have to change the materials in there? Is it uh, synthetic or anything else? Is that working for you to really achieve the climate goals? Indeed, yeah, that's the point where I said, the more holistic point of view to, to look at it and say basically it's from cradle to grave or back basically from sun to grave. So where does the energy come from? How do we convert it? How do we make that into the power source, basically, for our mobility needs, for our demands? And in particular, in terms of transportation, again, there is no leisure in there. Those vehicles move around for a certain purpose. And what you're mentioning there is quite right. This is a trend over the last few years to look into the fuel changing. So can we carbon neutralize the fuel, whether that is by generating them through electrified fuels, so it's called e-fuels, or actually even go one step further and use the simplest e-fuel, if you like, hydrogen, to store energy and basically convert that energy then again to moving vehicles around. Mm -hmm. And since you are a tech guy, as you mentioned, um, what about the technology readiness of this, let's say, e-fuels and the in engines for that? Um, are they ready for mass production and uh, are they efficient to enough to really, let me get back to that climate uh, <laughs> goal, is it really efficient to achieve uh, that uh, climate goal? Yeah, so first of all, to answer, yes, all of our components and stuff are e-fuel ready. We mm -hmm. have proven them over the past few years tested them upwards and downwards. So all of the material tests, all of the functional tests have been done also from a durability point of view. From that point, I'm fairly relaxed and say, yes, it can be done. Uh, it can be blended into today's fuel and 
most of the people wouldn't even notice that if it has a certain amount of biofuel in, if it has a certain amount of e-fuel in, you could straight away have a huge impact in terms of today's CO2 footprint that we have with the transportation. So for me, yeah, this would be definitely needed to do and pull that lever as well. So far, politics are, uh, politicians are not in favor of that because uh, there is no kind of mechanism behind how to credit for mm -hmm. having electrified fuels in. However, if we go one step further and in terms of efficiency, this is equally as good as today's fuels that we already know. Going one step further towards hydrogen, also that is a possibility to use in an engine. Of course, we will need to adapt some of the components. This is a slight difference because it's a gas engine than running. Uh, while still meeting the durability, high durability and versatility demands that today's engines have. We don't want to lose that benefit that today's mobility has, uh, but this can also be done. We have invested a lot of main power and brain power uh, in the last couple of years to bring that to a level where we are confident there are engines running on hydrogen, proving that it can be done. Now the question is how to scale that up, how to bring that into fleets, coming from demo vehicles, then basically also to larger fleets, and of course, the whole infrastructure behind, as we see today on a global basis, the kind of fight for energy is, is already ongoing. Yeah, yeah, and that is a, a good argument for saying, okay, it's not a good idea to just focus on one technology because it's not an independency at all. Um, yeah. Infrastructure is also a very good uh, buzzword and keyword. Um, I've never seen an e-fuel gas station anywhere, or is this just to mix it by, or how, how can we really um, make it yeah, work, yeah. actually? So it's as simple as you just mentioned in the part. It's mixing it, it's blending it in. That's what the technical term says. So I basically 5%, 10%, up to 20% can even with today's standards already be mixed in. Uh, of course, this has an immediate effect on the CO2 emissions. If there are electrified fuels using green power uh, to be produced. Um, so for us, this is a, a mandatory point and step. It's also one of the key puzzle pieces <laughs> to bring us into the carbon neutral future. I hope there's anywhere uh, a manual for it because I don't know how to mix it. <laughs> but it's a, no, it's you don't have to do <laughs> that. You don't have to do that at the pump. This is definitely something which oil companies do at the moment. So this is, for a user's point of view, it is the same. So it's a good you UX, use. you think? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, let us quickly go back to the political side. Um, you've mentioned it at the, at the beginning. Um, it's very political driven right now. The EU Parliament has decided to phase out combustion engines by 2035. That's for yeah. passenger cars. Um, has they have they also decided to yeah let's say to phase out every other technology because there isn't any chance to really um, yeah to to make it work until. 2035, uh, because there's not time for development, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> there is limited time to development. Of course, this is a steep ramp up that we're now going through with the industry. And this is also what we truly believe at Marlis. So we see not a single solution going forward, but multiple solutions. And we need to work on all those levers, as I already explained. Uh, in terms of time for commercial vehicles and larger vehicles, there is more time to do that kind of transition and it's only in Europe than if we go on a global basis. Obviously time frames are different. Sometimes it is a bit of a, a race if you like, uh, who can be first, uh, but we see very huge initiatives in terms of hydrogen economy coming from the Asian countries, so being in Japan, China, and also India now, uh, as well as in Europe, we have an initiative running to say, yes, also Europe has a mandate to bring up a hydrogen society mm -hmm. as a power source. And this is certainly a way forward that enables us more solutions to be used. And from, a, yeah, from an engineering point of view, I don't believe in excluding solutions that can help to lower the carbon, uh, the carbon emissions uh, up front. It's one of those things that, say, in the past, if we decided uh, by whomever, this is going to be the only solution forward, it generally is not the optimum solution for all of the cases that we're looking at. So maybe some of the politicians are watching us here. Um, so here's your chance <laughs> to convince them that it's also a good idea to invest in hydrogen. So can you please uh, bl briefly explain how, um, yeah, how can we use them? What are kind of applications, applications fields for them? 
Yeah, hydrogen, of course, is the one energy source uh, that has a higher energy density than a battery electric part from the stuff. And then there's mainly, very simply put, two ways how we can use energy. We can either convert that into power using a fuel cell. This is the one example which is usually prominent and can be used for really steady state kind of loads that we use and will also be used on stationary applications, so in households and stuff just for general purposes. And then there's the second option as it's a gas and it is reasonably easy to ignite, uh, so it comes with the benefit that it can also be used in a, an engine. And as I said before, we have that running for a number of years now in those engines uh, and seen phenomenal results in terms of efficiency. We see that they work very good. We have the durability under control, so this is the kind of thing where I'd say definitely for all of the ambient conditions where battery electric because of the infrastructure or just because of the environment, heat, air quality, uh, noise, everything is not possible. Uh, the duration that we need to run the hydrogen combustion engine is uh, a preferred option. So it's one solution, one pillar, if you like, uh, for future carbon neutral mobility. You've mentioned hydrogen combustion engine. Does yeah. this mean that we have to develop a whole new engine or is it possible to yeah, really use it with the existing combustion engines? In a way, of course, you have to tweak yeah. them. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> it's very much so. So it is still a, from the outside, I think, uh, other than people familiar with the part, most of the people wouldn't even notice that it is a hydrogen engine. You might hear a distinct different sound. So for people that are a bit more on the acoustic side, they will hear that the sound is different to a normal standard diesel if they see it. Is it louder truck. or li um, a uh, bit, little bit lighter? I wouldn't say in terms of loudness. I think it is a bit, yeah, less noise from the stuff, but it's a distinct different sound. So there's different frequencies that you see because it's a, a yeah, spark ignited. Okay. <laughs> that was so I think we have out. to test it <coughs> to, to figure yeah, out how no. it really sounds and <laughs> to get, to yeah, get that feeling, a little to challenge for it. <laughs> yeah, to get that proper feeling driving those around. Uh, on the outside, you won't see that. Of course, in the inside, there's a few things that you need to change. Mainly the injection system. Mainly, as I said, a spark igniting system. You need to change the piston rings to adapt them. But fundamentally, and that's the very good news, and this is also why this is a solution that could come into market on a shorter notice. So there's not that huge development still needed in order to bring it to a, what we call, industry yeah, level to actually being used on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it is fundamental still an engine, a combustion engine. We have the expertise, we have the production plants, we have the machines and everything uh, available. So this could be a short-term solution to bring that in uh, and ramp it up as soon as the infrastructure and the hydrogen is also available. So what means a short-term solution um, in 2020? I, I'd say <laughs> from 26 onwards. There's the first okay. engines will be 24, <laughs> even are announced, and we will see on the IAA transportation further announcement of customers coming with parts from us as well that we're not allowed to talk and name yet, uh, but I'm fairly sure uh, they will put our parts to very good use in those engines. All right, um, I asked you at the beginning about your successor of the job. Um, let us have a look at the future. What do you think, which jobs will be needed to really shape the future of transportation, right? And where do you have to put our spotlight on? Uh, in terms of jobs needed, uh, Maybe there is someone watching who wants to apply here. <laughs> that <laughs> would be also a good <laughs> chance for you to convince Definitely. them. <laughs> no. So people with, a, with an open mind, with a clear thinking in terms of what is physics, what is chemistry, what is electricity, what is needed, coming from software to hardware, there will still be material specialists needed. It needs people that are driven by mobility, if I may say mm -hmm. so. A bit cheesy, but it needs <laughs> people that want to achieve something, but they want to realize things. And I guess that has been at the heart of most of the engineers for the past century and more in trying to make things happen, to move things around and to see that. And that kind of spirit, that will be needed, not just in Europe, we'll need that globally. We'll need that uh, as this is vital for the society to have a mobility that is basically enabling prosperity and also yeah, a well-living 
Yeah, and we've seen all these capacities and these characteristics bundled into one person. Yeah. <laughs> thanks a lot for your insights. And of course, yeah. thanks for tuning in. If you're interested in learning more about tech and mobility, then of course, follow our channels. And here I have to say, this is the end of our Male Mobility Talks as part of IAA Transportation. Thanks for watching. See you soon and bye bye.